Thank you for braving the cold. Um, so this is the IOE Rough Cut Seminar. I'm Bruce Maxwell, the MSU Director of IOE. And uh, we're welcoming you today, Lindsay Albertson, Albertson <coughs> Brown, as the MSU <laughs> She did uh, get a BS degree from Brown University uh, in Rhode Island. And uh, Oh, it was in geology, biology, and worked as a research technician at the University of Florida and the Virginia Institute of Marine Science before starting graduate school at the University of California, Santa Barbara, um, in the ecology, evolution, marine biology department. After receiving her PhD in 2013, she uh, was a postdoc at the Stroud Water Research Center, a, profit, uh, a nonprofit. Uh, institute in Pennsylvania. So, I've been all over, back and forth across the country. Oh, yeah, traveled a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, came to MSU in 2015. She's an assistant professor in the ecology department, and she's going to talk about macrovertebrates in, uh, <clears throat> and they, are they in peril? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Bruce, for the introduction. Thanks, everybody, for coming. It's nice to see some familiar faces here. Um, before I start, I want to acknowledge my co-authors, Heidi Anderson, who was a master's student in my lab, and Dave Walters, who's with USGS. Um, he's been a collaborator on this project and has worked on salmon flies throughout the entire Rocky Mountain West. I also want to thank my funding sources. I got a faculty seat grant from the Montana Water Center and MSU. Okay, let's see how this is gonna work. Mm, maybe not, okay, maybe this. There we go. All right, so um, life history transitions and movements of animals often result in ephemeral resource pulses. And even though these resource pulses can be short at any one location, they have the potential to be prolonged over larger landscapes if they occur asynchronously or at different times in different places. And we have a couple of really um, amazing examples of this idea of prolonged asynchronous resource pulses that have come out of uh, relatively recent work. Um, so spawning salmon runs provide a really important high quality food resource to both um, aquatic and terrestrial consumers. And this recent work um, that's highlighted here has documented how gulls and bears will actually track different runs of salmon occurring in different rivers um, over time and thus prolong their opportunities for actually using or consuming this important resource pulse. Um, we have some really cool examples from around this area where ungulates uh, will actually track spring green up. So They'll utilize leaf out or green up that's occurring at relatively low elevations and then progressively move uphill until they're using green up that's occurring at higher elevations. And these trends are happening over relatively large scales. Um, we don't have as much evidence for small scale prolonged asynchronous resource pulses, but there has been um, at least one relatively recent paper looking at small scale resource pulses of aquatic insects. Um, so small scale on the orders of a reach or a riffle, so tens of meters, showing that variation in water temperature, which is the cue for the aquatic insect pulse, um, can vary within this small scale, so tens of meters, and thus prolong the time over which aquatic insects are emerging. <clears throat> so the pattern and duration of these resource pulses is driven by a variety of different environmental cues and variation in those cues. Common cues um, are things like temperature, precipitation, or water availability, and photo period. And in freshwater ecosystems, water temperature is probably the cue that's most important in driving variation in some of these resource pulses. Although water temperature as a whole influences a whole suite of responses, including some that are listed here, this list is not exhaustive, but we know that water temperature has important implications for things like species diversity, metabolic rates, the timing and size of runs of spawning fish, the timing and size of things like phytoplankton blooms, and the timing and size of things like insect hatches. 
So aquatic insect hatches are one of these resource pulses that are really tightly cued to variation in water temperature, um, both absolute water temperature and rates of change in temperature. And we know that a variety of both natural and anthropogenic influences alter water temperature regimes. So um, natural variation in uh, topography, for example, so maybe something like the presence of complex topography like uh, this canyon type of topography that's shown here that can influence water temperature, shading can influence water temperature, and things like tributary inputs can influence water temperature regimes. So those are natural examples. We also know that humans influence water temperature regimes in really important ways. So these are just a few examples of the ways that humans can alter water temp, including uh, channelization, withdrawal for agriculture, and damming. So it stands to reason that both of these factors, both natural and anthropogenic influences on temperature, may provide a really important control on the timing and duration of aquatic insect resource pulses because water temp is the cue for aquatic insect emergence. So just to visualize this um, in a little bit more detail, I've created two uh, very artificial landscapes here, okay? These are very simplified, uh, essentially just for illustration where we've got one landscape up top um, here that's a homogeneous environment and one down here that's a um, heterogeneous environment. And in this top environment, it's homogeneous, so we have one temperature, maybe it's something that's in the middle from cold to warm. And in this heterogeneous environment, we have multiple temperatures, everything from cold to medium to warm. And we might predict that in these two different landscapes, aquatic insect emergence may um, play out differentially. And we have some predictions for how that might work. So in the homogeneous environment where temp is relatively consistent across space or across time, the abundance of the resource, in this case, uh, I'm gonna be talking about aquatic insect hatches, is going to peak or get high at the same time um, or, over, uh, or over multiple locations at the same time. And we might define this as a synchronous resource pulse. In contrast, um, in an environment where water temp varies, we might predict asynchronous resource pulses where we have increases in the resource abundance occurring differentially across space or time. So each one of those distributions there maybe represents a different location or a different time of the year. <clears throat> so I've mentioned this aquatic insects resource, resource pulse as one of the dominant ones playing a part in freshwater ecosystems, but we know that aquatic insects emerging from aquatic systems hatching out into the terrestrial zone where the adults uh, mate and lay eggs and then die is probably the key resource subsidy for both aquatic and terrestrial consumers. So we've got aquatic consumers here such as fish, and we know that terrestrial consumers such as spiders and birds also make use of this really important resource pulse or resource subsidy. However, there's pretty strong evidence that like a lot of aquatic species, Aquatic insects are um, in trouble. So these are data from a paper in 2010 where they compared uh, the status of different taxa in the 80s to more recent uh, status in the 2000s for freshwater insects. And you can see that over a quarter of the species that they were able to actually track changes in status, um, over a quarter of them would be classified as anywhere from vulnerable to extinct just since the 1980s. So aquatic insects provide this really important resource pulse um, cued to water temperature. We don't know a whole lot about it, but at the same time, we know that aquatic insects are uh, potentially in trouble. So um, <clears throat> my lab has been interested in what we make of these resource pulses. So how do they operate? Can we actually measure them at relatively broad scales? And um, once we develop that baseline, will that help us draw some conclusions or make some inference about how we expect these resources to change in the future. So I'm gonna address two questions today. How does resource availability and phenology vary among rivers that differ in their natural and anthropogenic complexity with the idea that that natural and anthropogenic complexity is driving temperature, which is the cue for emergence? And then how, shifting, how will shifting environmental conditions change the size and patterns of these resource pulses? I'm gonna focus on a particular taxon, the giant salmon fly, Terranarsis californica. Um, I've got some pictures up here of Terranarsis. So these are the larvae, and then these two pictures show the adults. Um, 
there are a couple reasons why I'm going to focus on this particular taxon. Um, so they can dominate aquatic terrestrial subsidies where they're abundant. We have pretty good evidence of that. They're a food resource for both aquatic and terrestrial consumers. We have evidence that both types of consumers will actually chow down and eat these guys. <coughs> they're huge. They're one of the largest bodied macroinvertebrates um, that exists. So the adults can be up to three inches long, which is pretty giant for aquatic macroinvertebrates. And they show these really interesting um, patterns in their pulse phenology. So emergence events, um, they happen en masse. So a bunch of salmon flies emerging all at the same time so that they can mate and lay eggs. But these emergence events can be relatively brief at any one location. So less than a week sometimes. I'm also focusing on them because humans love salmon flies, okay? These guys have sort of a special place in a lot of people's hearts. Um, we name festivals after them, we name beers after them, we write movies about them, um, and we know that fly fishermen come from all over the world to specifically fish the salmon fly hatch. At the same time, um, we have anecdotal evidence from fishermen, so lots of people around here spend a lot of time outside um, tracking the salmon fly hatch um, sort of qualitatively, and we have lots of evidence or at least stories from fishermen that these guys might be in decline which is potentially a problem for the natural ecosystem because we know they represent this really important food resource, but also for our culture and economy um, here in Montana. So I'm gonna talk about um, two sort of stories that relate to describing what salmon flies are doing here in Southwestern Montana. In the first part of the talk, I'm gonna describe emergence patterns on two rivers, the Gallatin and Madison, Madison rivers and across spatial scales. So across the whole river, versus a site-specific um, emergence pattern. And then I'm gonna talk about population changes through time on the Madison River. So I'm gonna select one of those rivers because that's the river for which we actually have some uh, long-term historical record. So I'm gonna start out with emergence patterns on these two rivers, the Gallatin and Madison Rivers. They're both located um, relatively close to each other here in Southwestern Montana. Um, and <clears throat> for those of, you who don't know, most of you guys in this room are probably familiar with these two rivers. Um, even though they're relatively close to one another, they show pretty strong differences in both their natural and their human um, influence. So the Madison flows through this really broad agricultural valley. It's dam regulated. It's got a couple dams on it. And it has very few tributaries that actually drain into the main stem. And of those tributaries that do actually make it to the main stem, Many of them are dewatered due to agricultural withdrawal. Okay, so one type of river. And I'm gonna contrast emergence patterns on the Madison with the Gallatin River, which um, shows some pretty stark differences. So the Gallatin flows through national forest and parkland. It has really complex topography, so it shows its alternating um, canyon valley topography. It's free flowing, it's undammed and it has frequent inputs from large snowmelt tributaries, so sources of relatively cold water. So these two rivers set up a really nice contrast to ask questions about what factors might be driving emergence patterns of salmon flies. So I'm gonna address three main questions in this first part. The first is, does water temperature actually cue salmon fly emergence? Um, it likely does. We have lots of evidence from other species, but not a lot is known about this directly, or we don't have quantitative data yet. Um, for salmon flies in Montana. So that's the very first basic question. How do patterns of salmon fly emergence vary between the two different rivers? And then how do these patterns vary at multiple spatial scales? So I'm gonna to try to address all three of these questions um, in this first part of the talk. To do this, um, we've got five study sites on each of the rivers. The study sites are shown here as black dots. Um, so five sites on each river and we did some uh, preliminary scouting to choose sites where salmon flies are relatively abundant. So we chose sites that have over 15 larvae per square meter. So larvae, salmon fly larvae are definitely present at these sites. We measured emergence timing in two years, 2016 and 17. And we have uh, water temp data for 2017. <clears throat> To quantify emergence, I'm gonna present a couple different types of responses. Um, for both responses, we use exuvia counts to quantify emergence. So when these guys are ready to emerge from the aquatic um, habitat, they crawl to the side of the river, um, 
shimmy out of their shucks or their exoskeleton, which are shown um, here. So these are all exuvia or shucks. You can see, you know, their heads are missing here. So they've shimmied out of these exoskeletons. And this paper, Walters et al. 2017, actually showed it's um, much more accurate to quantify salmon fly emergence events using shucks instead of trying to catch adults. It's actually pretty tricky to catch adult insects. So shucks provide a really quantitative um, and relatively easy way to actually quantify emergence. So that's what we um, use, that technique. We walked transects at each one of those five sites over the period um, at which salmon flies are emerging. And that results in some sort of emergence curve that looks like this. So we've got exuvia per meter. So that's counting the number of exuvia per meter walked on um, individual transects across time. So Julian date is on the x-axis there. And around here, for emergence events, we're talking sometime mid-June to late July. That's typically when emergence is happening in the rivers around here. So we um, produce these types of curves for quantifying emergence. And I'm gonna talk about the duration of emergence, which is just the length of time um, over which salmon flies are emerging. And we lop off the two tails. So duration for us is uh, first day of greater than 5% emergence to the first day of uh, greater than 95% emergence. So that section in the middle there, lopping off the two tails. So I'll talk about duration, and then I will talk about median emergence state. So those are our two responses for emergence patterns. <clears throat> All right, so the first thing I'm gonna show you is evidence that water temperature does actually cue emergence for salmon flies. Um, on this graph, we've got spring water temp on the X, and spring water temp turns out to be really highly correlated with emergence events. And this is a compilation of April and May water temp. So spring water temp cues emergence is happening in June and July. And then median emergence date is on the y-axis here. And the data for both rivers um, across those two years, so 2016 and 2017 are shown here. So five sites for each river, Gallatin's in blue, Madison's in red. And you can see that for both rivers, um, they're highly correlated with spring water temperature. So emergence happens uh, earlier at sites where water temperature, spring water temperature is relatively warm, and emergence happens later at sites where spring water temperature is relatively cool. So we know now for sure that salmon flies in this system appear to be cued, their emergence appears to be cued by uh, water temperature, and this is the case for both rivers. <clears throat> So the next response variable here is gonna focus on large scale patterns of emergence phenology. Um, so I'm gonna talk about large scale patterns first and then site specific or small scale patterns. Uh, I just wanna orient you to this graph uh, first before I dive into the results. So the two rivers, Madison and Gallatin rivers, um, percent salmon flies emerge. So the results here are gonna look like those cumulative emergence curves across time. So again, we're talking sometime mid June to late July for emergence of salmon flies around here. Across those five sites, and the sites are gonna be color coded from most downstream to upstream. So most downstream is one and most upstream is five. And this is what the emergence patterns look like. So I'm gonna draw your attention to three main results. There's a lot going on here, but I think there are really um, three take home points from these differences in emergence patterns. The first is that duration of emergence across the whole river varies really substantially across the two rivers. So um, the Madison River has salmon flies emerging from the most downstream to upstream site for almost an entire month, whereas the Gallatin only has salmon flies emerging, emerging for about two weeks. So we see much longer emergence events across the entire riverscape that we were able to measure um, for the Madison River. So that's the first thing. Um, the second thing I'll draw your attention to is where the peaks at different sites fall. Um, so if we just look at peak emergence for the Madison, you guys can hopefully see that this basically marches in an upstream wave. So the most downstream site uh, emerges and then subsequent sites upstream emerge sequentially after that. So there's this really clear upstream wave um, in emergence that occurs from downstream to upstream on the Madison. There is a slight upstream wave on the Gallatin, so these most upstream sites do tend to emerge later than the downstream, but it's much less pronounced than for the Madison. And in fact, 
these three downstream sites are emerging at essentially exactly the same time. And in one year, um, it's a little hard to see, but these uh, double bumps here just represent emergence differences between the two years over which we measured. In one year, site five, the most upstream site, actually emerged at exactly the same time as the three sites emerging downstream. So the take home point there is just that the Madison shows these emergence patterns where emergence is marching upstream in this upstream wave, whereas the Gallatin is not. As a result, we conclude that there are differences in the synchronicity of the resource pulse on these two rivers. So on the Madison River, the resource pulse is relatively asynchronous. That is, it's happening across different sites at different times, potentially prolonging the amount of time over which this really important food resource is available. And in comparison, the Gallatin River shows a relatively synchronous emergence pattern. So sites are emerging at about the same time. <clears throat> All right, site-specific emergence phenology. So we see that the Madison shows river scale emergence that lasts longer. We see the opposite pattern, which was a bit of a surprise to us for small scale emergence patterns. Um, so here again, this is the same exact graph, except we're looking at the width of this distribution. So just considering within a single site how long um, emergence is happening for salmon flies. And those data are also summarized in that box plot on the right. So just looking at the number of days per site that emergence is happening. And we see the opposite pattern, that the Gallatin actually has emergence that lasts, on average, two days longer than the Madison River. So opposite patterns of emergence duration when we consider large scale versus small scale emergence duration. Um, and we don't exactly know what the mechanism is here yet. Um, we have some work to do to characterize water temperature regimes, especially in the Gallatin River but we suspect that there's more heterogeneity in water temperature at the small scale, so the reach scale for salmon flies in the Gallatin River, potentially because of that shading or complex topography or tributary inputs that may be prolonging the site-specific small scale duration of salmon flies on that river. All right, so I'll summarize everything I've shown you from this first part of the talk. Um, spring water temperatures do cue emergence for salmon flies. River scale emergence patterns differ drastically between these two rivers that are in relatively close proximity. We see that uh, river scale emergence lasts two times as long on the Madison River, um, extending almost a full month. It's relatively asynchronous emergence on the Madison compared to the Gallatin, which is relatively synchronous. And we see that small scale emergence patterns also differ across rivers, except in the opposite pattern where we've got about 25% longer emergence occurring on the Gallatin River at specific sites. So now I've shown you evidence that emergence patterns for salmon flies are driven by temperature. They're actually pretty complex. They can vary across rivers in relatively similar locations, so here in southwest Montana. Um, and we didn't know a whole lot, at least quantitatively, about these patterns before we were able to put together this data set. Now we have a baseline that we're hoping that we can use to explore some patterns and changes in things like emergence and abundance of salmon flies over time. So for the second part of the talk, I'm going to talk about uh, population changes, but I'm going to focus on a particular river, the Madison, because that's the one river for which we have long-term records. So I'm going to focus in on the Madison River. Um, again, this is a river in southwestern Montana. Um, and we've got a, a variety of different types of data sets. The one I'm going to focus on the most is probably represented here, although I'll show you a map with our full um, site selection here in a second. Um, and what's pretty cool about this is that on the Madison, we've got long-term historical records for things like density of salmon flies and emergence patterns. For um, this set of five sites, three sites below NS Reservoir or NS Lake, and two sites above NS Reservoir. So for a lot of what I'm gonna be talking about, we'll be looking at changes to these particular sites um, over time. Before we get there though, I will just raise the question um, that I think was eating at a lot of folks around here and that was brought up to me by some fisheries biologists who are interested in whether salmon flies are actually in decline because we have some anecdotal evidence from um, fishermen that they may be. Um, and we do see some evidence that uh, environmentally, Ma the Madison River has changed over time and may be driving changes to the salmon fly population sizes or emergence timing. 
Um, so just as a rough cut here, I'll give you some background data on things that might be changing in the Madison. We know it's dammed, um, and we know that temperature's changing. So we have a USGS gauge on the Madison River that's been there since 1977. And over the period of record, we do see evidence for an increase in mean annual water temp of 1.2 degrees C. There is anecdotal evidence in an increase in fine sediment. So uh, we have a master's thesis that was done at MSU in 19, it was published in 1978, but the data were collected in 1977. Um, and JJ Fraley actually collected information on salmon flies and things like sediment levels back in the 70s. So there's anecdotal or qualitative evidence that not only do we see potentially a change in temperature, but potentially a change in fine sediment. So um, with, armed with this evidence, so maybe something's going on with temperature, maybe something's going on with sediment, and fishermen um, observing that salmon flies are declining or changing at least their population sizes in the Madison, um, we are interested in trying to figure out whether that's actually occurring and why. So I mentioned changes in temp and sediment, so I'm gonna focus on those two environmental drivers for this part of the talk, and that's because we have a good amount of evidence indicating that both of these environmental drivers may influence salmon flies. So we know that warming water temperatures influence body size, so as temp gets warmer, body size tends to get smaller, can change emergence timing, leading to earlier emergence, and can decrease abundance, so we know that a lot of Aquatic insects are sensitive to these types of things. We also know that fine sediment is uh, potentially an environmental driver altering salmon fly populations. So increasing fine sediment influences physiology. It can decrease habitat availability or suitable habitat, and it can decrease abundance. So these things that we think might be going on in the Madison River, there's pretty strong evidence that they ultimately may be influencing aquatic insect populations and particularly salmon flies. And at the same time, we know that long-term data sets um, documenting these types of changes over time are lacking. So it's hard to draw any conclusions when you know, someone hasn't been out there necessarily monitoring um, regularly over the period for which we see changes in water temp or sediment, for example. So we um, went out trying to figure out how we could actually assess whether population changes on the Madison are changing. And we collected a variety of different types of data. So water temperature, uh, this picture on the top left is Heidi installing a water temperature gauge, a hobo, um, in the winter there. You can see there's snow on the bank. So we measured water temperature at a bunch of sites. We characterized substrate using a variety of standard methods, including things like pebble counts and quantifying things like percent embeddedness or fine sediment accumulation. We measured features of the adults of salmon flies, so adult body size. And we also measured features of the larvae, and I'm gonna focus mostly on larval abundance. <clears throat> so like I mentioned, for this part of the talk, we have a whole suite of data sets here, and I'm sort of gonna jump back and forth between which sites contributed to which um, outcome or result. I think the details of the sites don't matter a whole lot, but if anyone wants to ask about it or chat about it after, um, during questions, I'm really happy to do that. So I'll just run through this quickly. Um, again, we've got our two rivers in southwestern Montana, Gallatin and Madison. We're focusing on the Madison River here on the left. Um, we've got water temperature at that location with the star, which is where the USGS gauge is. It's been there since 1977 collecting data, and we do see an increase in mean annual water temp over that period of record. We've got those five sites that J.J. Fraley measured in 1977, so part of that master's thesis. So he actually measured things like substrate um, description, so described the substrate, collected larval abundance and adult body size. So we have records of that from 1977. And we also have emergence timing at two of the sites. So those are outlined in yellow here, site two and site five. Um, and I'm really excited about this. I think this is pretty cool. This is data that was collected by a citizen scientist, so somebody who lives in Ennis and just really enjoys fly fishing, and has recorded when he's been fishing the salmon fly hatch since 1973, and was willing to share his data with us on those patterns, which is pretty cool. Um, and again, you know, here I'll just emphasize that we sort of had to put together these data sets a little bit piecemeal because we didn't necessarily have a continuous record or a continuous group of people that were recording information on salmon fly populations over time. So a little bit of this is actually piecemeal. So 
we have these five sites that we went back and sampled in 2017 to compare what's going on in the 70s to what's happening now. And we also added uh, several sites further upstream. So sites six through 11 um, are sites where we have taken additional information in 2017. Um, so current records of things like water temperature, substrate characterization, and salmon fly larval abundance. Um, so extending all the way up there to one site that's in Yellowstone National Park, that's site 11. <clears throat> At those sites, we also characterize things like adult body size and current emergence timing. And I'll point out that the Madison um, shows these really stark um, differences in things like water temperature and sediment levels depending on where you are um, in the watershed. So these sites together from one to 11 span about a four degree C gradient, which is a relatively large gradient, and they span a pretty wide um, degree gradient in fine sediment level. So it's cut off a little bit there, but anywhere from zero to 33% fine sediment. <clears throat> All right, so I'm gonna address uh, three major questions in this part of the talk. First, do shifting environmental conditions influence salmon fly abundance, body size, and emergence phenology? going to try to figure out if we can use the data we have to identify whether water temperature and or fine sediment is driving these changes that we might observe. And then finally, what, the, what does the future look like? So um, I'm going to present some data that we do think we're seeing changes and then a model that um, hopefully will help us predict what we think salmon flies will look like into the future. All right, so the first thing I'm going to start with here is evidence for shifting abundance over time. So I'll orient you to this graph. We've got site on the x-axis um, where the downstream sites are shown on the left. So one, two, and three are downstream of NS Reservoir or NS Lake. And NS, NS Reservoir is shown there with that dotted line in between sites three and four. Um, and sites four and five are upstream, upstream of NS Reservoir or NS Lake. Um, and what we're looking at here is salmon fly larvae per square meter from J.J. Fraley's master's thesis where data were collected in 1977. And um, I think there are two points here. One is that salmon flies were present at all of the sites in 1977, and that there's maybe a hint that they were more abundant upstream of the reservoir than downstream. Um, so those sites four and five have higher abundances, although these are not statistically significantly different. And here are the data that we collected in 2017. Um, this probably is not surprising for folks who spend time on the Madison River, um, but we've got a few things going on here. First off, the X's for sites one, two, and three represent salmon flies being below detection. So we increased our size of sampler by four times and the number of samples that we took, and we could not find any salmon fly larvae. Um, they're not necessarily extirpated, and I'll show you some data on salmon fly emergence that shows they're still there, but they're essentially below detection. So we can't say that they're extirpated or extinct from below Ennis, but they're, um, we'll say below detection. Okay, so below Ennis Reservoir, sites one, two, and three, their uh, salmon flies are basically nil. They're still present at the sites upstream of Ennis Reservoir, so sites four and five. So they're still there, although there's maybe some hint that their population sizes, even at those sites upstream, are declining. Um, we only took data in, in one year, and abundances can be pretty variable from year to year, so we can't say for sure that populations are on the decline upstream, but there's maybe a hint that this may be occurring at sites four and five as well. But the main take-home point here, I think, is that below Ennis Reservoir, there are no salmon flies anymore, or at least they're below detection, and this corresponds really well with what we've heard from local fisheries biologists and fishermen. So we've tried to figure out what might be driving this decline, and I'll give the punchline here and then um, provide some data that's leading us toward this conclusion. So essentially salmon flies were not detected, so below, detec below detection at sites where summer temp is potentially stressful. So at sites one, two, and three, mean August temperature exceeds 19 degrees C. Um, this is a stressful water temperature for salmon flies. And actually this value 19 degrees C corresponds really well with data from Oregon. We don't actually have a lot of data demonstrating like the factor that could be driving declines in salmon fly populations. 
but there is one study in Oregon that shows a very similar pattern where samophytes do not exist in rivers where summer temperature exceeds 18.6 degrees C. So that's pretty consistent with the findings that we have here. <clears throat> so like I said, you know, we don't necessarily have uh, monitoring records over this period. We're drawing conclusions that temperature might be limiting uh, distributions of salmon flies or salmon fly abundance. Um, and our current data sets, I think, help us um, get to that conclusion or lead us toward that conclusion. So the data I'm going to present now are going to focus on current larval densities to provide us with some evidence that temperature, especially stressful temperatures, may be regulating the density of salmon flies currently. And I'm hoping that that helps us make some inference about what might have gone on in the past. So we've got those 11 sites, so spanning the whole Madison River from Yellowstone down below um, Ennis Lake. We've got larval densities at all those sites for 2017, so current larval densities, and they vary widely, so anywhere between zero and 117 individuals per square meter. Um, that gradient spans four degrees C in a water temperature and zero to 33% fine sediment. And the way we went after this question of what might be limiting or driving current uh, salmon fly abundances is to use AIC model selection. So this is essentially a statistical approach that allows you to evaluate different models and how much support those models have for explaining your response variables. So in this case, our response is current larval densities of salmon flies. So you create a suite of models that include potential drivers that you think are important. So in our case, we think temperature and substrate are important. So these are the types of uh, environmental drivers we put into our AIC model selection. Um, so temperature, we've got a, a variety of different ways to quantify temperature there, everything from summer temp um, to mean summer water temperature to highest seven day moving average and a variety of different responses of substrate. And again, this lets, this lets you evaluate the relative support for different models for what environmental drivers might be controlling current larval densities. So I'm not gonna go into a whole lot about, more about AIC model selection, just that this is one approach that might give us some indication for what factor is controlling current larval density. So I'm presenting the outcome of that AIC model selection um, exercise here is a table, which I know has a lot going on, um, but I will draw your attention, I think, to the most important thing. So the way this works is that your best model um, has your lowest AIC score. So the AIC scores are shown in this column here. Your best model has the lowest AIC score, and then your delta AIC is just comparing what the other scores are relative to that best model. <clears throat> and anything that has a delta AIC uh, greater than two would differentiate the model. So it would say that the model that's greater than two delta AIC doesn't do as good of a job explaining your response variable, which in our case is current larval density. So I've highlighted here the two best models um, that are not different, right? Their delta AIC is only 0.5. And what this indicates um, to us is that summer temperatures are probably the factor driving distributions of current larval densities, or at least provide support for the fact that late summer temperatures may be influencing current larval um, densities. The models that included sediment, so we've got a couple of them, these are just the top models, but a couple of them here include those factors related to sediment, um, did not score as high, right? So they're not necessarily falling out in this particular analysis as being um, drivers. But we can't rule out the fact that fine sediment may be influencing salmon flies. This is something that we hope to pursue in the future. All right, so I've talked about whether shifting environmental conditions are influencing salmon fly abundance, and we think that temperature is probably the primary constraint on abundance. Um, I'm gonna present data uh, quickly here looking at body size and emergence phenology, which are two important responses that could have consequences for the ecosystem and for uh, consumers. So the first thing I'll present here is that body size is related to temperature. Um, this isn't a huge surprise given what we know for the relationships between insect body size and temp. Um, so these are current body sizes across our um, sites that we currently measure for females and male salmon flies. 
Um, so mean water temperature shown on the mean annual water temperature is shown on the X and exuvia length, which is a pretty good proxy for body size, is shown on the Y. And there are a couple points here. Um, first is that females are larger than males. Um, this is well known for salmon flies. So females are larger than males, but there's this negative relationship with water temperature. So if water temperature on average is warmer, salmon flies tend to be smaller in body size. So we see that currently, um, exuvia length is about 13% shorter at the warmest site compared to the coolest site. And um, this also corresponds with what we observe using those historical records, that temperature may be driving differences in body size over time. So the response variable here is a little bit different. This is adult salmon fly dry weight. So instead of exuvia length, it's uh, dry weight. And I'm showing uh, two separate graphs, one's for females, one's for males. And I'll just point out the scales there are different, right? The females are larger than the males, so the scales are a little bit different. Um, at two sections of the Madison, so the lower Madison sites one through three, and the upper Madison. And I'm showing the data there for the lower Madison with the X for below detection because we couldn't measure body size because we couldn't find any salmon flies there in 2017. But interestingly, we see evidence for a decline in body size at the two sites upstream of Ennis Reservoir. Um, so the data for 2017 are showed in the blue bars here. And this is a statistically significant difference where males have decreased their body size by about 11% and females have decreased their body size by about 15%. So again, providing some evidence that temperature, which we know currently correlates with size of salmon flies, may be influencing what has um, gone on in the Madison River over time. Okay, and the last um, story I'll tell here about the Madison River relates to emergence phenology. So people have been interested in how things like climate warming influence the timing of emergence events or things like um, flowering events for vegetation. Um, and we suspected that if the Madison River is warming, we should see earlier emergence timing on the Madison River. So we've got two sites, um, site two and site five. So site two is black um, downstream of Ennis Reservoir and site five is gray upstream of Ennis Reservoir, where we have long-term records of emergence timing from that citizen scientist. Otherwise, we would not have these data. So it's pretty amazing that he's been keeping such a good record of when he's uh, fishing the salmon fly hatch. So I put up some rough estimates of what we think might be going on there. So our predictions that if temperature is warming, so it's warmer, in recent years, we expect emergence to be happening earlier. But what we actually see is no evidence for earlier emergence timing. So um, first emergence date is shown for the two sites here. And again, these are data from that citizen scientist. Um, and there are a couple key points here. Um, there's no statistical relationship here between first emergence date and time for either site. Um, <clears throat> There are a couple of interesting patterns. The first is that site two, so the site below Ennis Reservoir has fewer data points there. Um, I don't know if it's easy to pick out or not, but there are, you can trust me, there are fewer data points there. And even though um, Phil Farns did detect emergence in relatively recent years, he did not detect emergence for 13 of the last 20 years. So, this is providing support or evidence um, for that conclusion that salmon flies are probably not extinct or completely extirpated below NS Reservoir, but they functionally don't serve the role that they may have historically um, served. So they're still present, but if they are, they're few and far between, they're relatively low in abundance, and there were only emergency events um, in 13 of the last, in seven of the last 20 years. Okay, so again, no evidence for earlier emergence timing um, through time, and we do see fewer emergence events at site two. I'll also point out that the spread here for a particular site is huge, right? So for any given site here, emergence could be happening, you know, on Julian date 160 or 190. So the spread of timing of emergence is huge. Um, that just represents year-to-year -year variation in what summer and what spring temperature looks like. And I'll also say that um, we don't observe warming during springtime, given the records that we have from that USGS gauge. 
So we observe a 1.2 degrees C increase in mean annual temp, but spring annual temp has only increased by about 0 0.01 degrees C. What it looks like is that all of the warming is happening in the summer months. So warming is occurring differentially across the year. And that's important because the summer months appear to constrain current larval densities, right? Stressful water temperatures in the late summer appear to affect larval abundance, whereas spring water temperature is the environmental cue that would be leading to a change potentially in emergence time. But we don't see spring water temps at least yet warming. All right, so what does the future look like? Um, I think I've provided some evidence that we are seeing changes in salmon fly abundance body size um, and not so much in emergence phenology over time. Um, but this has led us to ask what um, the future might look like on the Madison River for salmon flies. Um, and so we chose one way to approach this using Dan Isaac's uh, Norwest temp models to ask whether we expect uh, thermally suitable habitat to continue to be available for salmon flies into the future. So these models um, can project water temperature out to 2100. And we have um, set a threshold at 19 degrees C, which is the, the temperature at which we don't see current larvae existing. Um, so it's sort of an arbitrary, arbitrary threshold for the Norwest models. But for us, this threshold makes sense because we don't see salmon flies existing at sites where mean August temp exceeds 19 degrees C. And here's what those projections look like um, for 2100. So the Madison River um, flowing from south to north here, and this reservoir is located um, here, right? So what this model does is just show you variation of water temperature, and red indicates mean August temp greater than 19 degrees C. And this corresponds pretty well with what we know is currently going on. So below in this reservoir, summer temperatures are really hot. They exceed uh, mean August temp of 19 degrees C. But what's maybe a little worrisome and surprising is what's going on above NS reservoir in this model. So this section here, right, has a lot of habitat that becomes thermally unsuitable for salmon flies um, by 2100. And this is a loss of 25% of currently suitable habitat. So we know that salmon flies do currently exist you know, here above NS Reservoir, but this is suggesting that um, that thermally suitable habitat is gonna decline by about 25%. And ultimately, this model suggests that about 50% of, current, of occupiable habitat by salmon flies has been lost since 1977. And that includes all of the habitat below NS Reservoir and that chunk that we're predicting um, will go away in the next several years. All right, so to summarize all that, um, we see that increased water temperatures lead to reduced body size of salmon flies, reduced abundance, and earlier emergence. So salmon flies do emerge earlier in years that are warmer. However, we don't see a long-term trend in emergence phenology because warming's not uniform throughout the year. So we're seeing warming happening in summer, not so much in spring. So we don't yet observe a change in emergence phenology um, across years for salmon flies which isn't to say it won't happen in the future, we just don't see evidence for it yet. Current salmon fly populations appear to be constrained by late summer temps that are stressful for them, and we expect or predict continued upstream range contraction as that thermally suitable habitat declines over time. So I'll just wrap up um, by bringing us back to what I mentioned in the beginning of this talk, which is that these emergence events for aquatic insects represent a really important resource pulse to both aquatic and terrestrial consumers. Um, the differences in the patterns that I've shown you may have important implications for consumers. Um, for example, immobile consumers such as spiders, like this one here. Um, I pulled this picture off of the internet, which is pretty amazing. It shows a wolf spider eating a salmon fly. Um, spiders are relatively immobile. They may benefit from prolonged site-specific emergence duration. Whereas mobile consumers such as fish and birds may benefit from prolonged or asynchronous um, river scale emergence where they can actually track something like that resource wave that I showed you guys data for on the Madison River. <clears throat> At the same time, the patterns I've shown you uh, I think are a little bit worrisome for this other group, humans, 
Um, we know that a lot of people come here to Montana to specifically fish the salmon fly hatch. And we do think we have a pretty convincing case that salmon flies may be declining and future and threatened into the future um, in this area, especially on the Madison River. We don't yet know uh, what the cost of that will be. So uh, I've got a future direction slide here to suggest some things we're interested in for future research, um, which are questions like, will salmon flies continue to decline and show range contraction? And if so, what's the consequence for our culture and our economy? To what extent do consumers actually track these resources? How do consumer community composition uh, vary in rivers displaying these really stark differences in emergence phenology? That is, is the consumer community on the Madison River different from the Gallatin River? How does ecosystem function change as salmon flies decline? So I didn't talk much about this, but salmon flies are shredders. Um, we think they're mostly eating wood and leaf parts. And if they're essentially, excuse me, eliminated from um, ecosystems, that may have an important consequence for carbon processing and cycling of nutrients. And then finally, how do these changes that we're observing in Montana correspond to changes that may be happening in other parts of the Rockies in rivers that support salmon fly populations? So with that, I think I have some time for questions. Um, I'll thank a few people who made this work happen. Phil Farns, who was the citizen scientist who provided us emergence phenology data. Fraley, who collected those data for his master's thesis in 1977. Dave Moser at Fish, Wildlife, and Parks. Um, Niall, Charlotte, and Kaylee, who are undergrad assistants who helped us with this work. And of course, my lab, Wyatt's lab, and Jeff Cool's lab. And I'll take questions. Yeah. I got one. I'm, I'm not sure about aquatic insects, but some terrestrial insects emerge on a sort of a cumulative heat index, or in mm -hmm. other words, that it takes so many days over so many temperatures and years, things look like it's just a threshold when it hits that certain temperature, then they emerge or they or they're or they're eliminated. Is that mm -hmm. true or is this just we don't know is the answer. So it makes very logical sense that something like degree days may be more informative than mean spring temperature. Um, we've tried to figure out what that degree days measurement would be for salmon flies. Um, no one's ever done it. I mean, we have information like that for fish, um, but we don't know exactly what that would be for salmon flies. So when we were exploring you know, what temperature responses appear to correlate most strongly with the emergent state. Mean temp did a pretty amazing job. I mean, the R squareds there are 0.97. Um, so without having to go into the lab or something and figure out precisely what the degree day measurement is for salmon flies, we have to date just used mean spring temp. Which isn't to say that something like, you know, a cumulative amount of days above a certain temp wouldn't be as informative or more informative. We just don't have the data to know what that would be for salmon flies in particular. But it's a, it's a good point. And we're interested in doing it. I think it would require some work in the lab though to figure out how, you know, how long they would have to be at a certain temp to get them to go. Yeah. You know when the NSTM was put in? Mm, 1930 something? Someone in the audience know by chance? Oh six. Thanks, Tom. My ask that is it's too bad that you don't have a temperature station on the upper Madison because over the hundred years mm -hmm. the uh, those reservoirs are filling in uh -huh. shallower. Yes. So that, that would explain the July and August increase. increase. So this brings up a good point. Um the gauge, the temp gauge that we have, which is the record that we've been able to find, I mean, there might be other records out there, but this is the record we've been able to find for water temp, um, is below Ennis Reservoir, which has been progressively filling up and warming. And then that water is dumped into the lower Madison and anyone who spends time out there knows it's super warm. Um, so um, I think for us, what that brings up is that first question I brought up, which is, do we actually expect them to continue to decline? Because it may just be an artifact of the dam. You know, it may be less related to something like climate warming um, than we think. Like it might just be an artifact of NS dam filling up and being really warm. 
We don't know. It's hard to piece that apart because we don't have a record of temp upstream. But what we're hoping, I guess, is that um, we will continue to measure, or we're hoping to continue to monitor salmon fly abundance upstream of Venice Reservoir as well, and have temperature loggers out there and, and maybe be able to draw some inference about rates of warming upstream of the dam versus downstream at some point. But it's a good point. It, you know, it also brings up the fact that it may not just be climate warming. Damming or agricultural withdrawal or other anthropogenic influences may be creating temperature regimes that influence aquatic insects. That's something you don't hear about quite as much. Man. It's probably a difficult question, but would it be possible to really think in the lab? Like if you did, how many years are you going to uh, yeah, um, it's possible to rear them in the lab. The problem is that not only are they large, they're long lived. So as larvae, they're in the stream anywhere from two to four years. Um, Heidi did run an experiment looking at growth rates um, at different temperatures at the Fish Tech Center over three months. And it's not enough time to observe differences in growth, even at really widely ranging temperatures. So it's possible to keep them in the lab. It, I don't know if they would actually last three or four years. Um, they did last three months, but the you know, financial resources to do that are not at my disposal. Yeah. <laughs> it would also be really neat to be able to track them in the field, but that's really hard to do with aquatic insects. Um, you know, what I can say, maybe related to that is, if we couldn't get really fine scale measurements in the lab, we have a gradient in temp in the field that may help us figure some of these questions out. Um, where, uh, so the site in Yellowstone is relatively warm because of all the geothermal activity there. And the body size of salmon flies there is small compared to other parts of the Madison River. Um, so we may be able to make use of the natural gradient in temperature to ask questions about body size or growth. Um, we just haven't gotten there yet. What about putting cages in the river? Monitoring, you know, over time, uh, you could do that for multiple years and go back and check the cages. Yeah, you could, but the cages would have to stay put. No one would have to mess with them. Yeah. They'd have to be fine enough that the larvae couldn't get out, which means you're probably cleaning them every day. Mm. <laughs> yeah, you, as soon as you put something in a stream, uh, detritus builds up on it, so... Um, those are all really good ideas. <laughs> it's similar kinds of challenges in front of Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe we'll figure something out eventually. Yeah. What are the, knowing nothing about aquatic insects, but what are the implications for other insects? Other aquatic insects? Ooh, that's a good question. So, most aquatic insects are cued by temperature, so their emergence events might respond similarly. It's hard to say because we haven't tracked it. Um, exactly, but it stands to reason in my mind that if salmon flies are showing a response to temperature changing over time, um, other insects might as well. <laughs> um, what else can I say about that? So body size and temp is related for a lot of different taxa, and Wyatt Cross has a student actually studying uh, changes in body size across a gradient in stream temperature. So you could stay tuned for her data, which are out of the Gallatin River, but she's looked at a variety of mayfly and caddisfly species. And so we'll have that information for different taxa responding to temperature, either similarly or not. Um, yeah, and then the other thing I would say, you know, one of the reasons we did focus on salmon flies is because they're, they're so big. And I mentioned, you know, a few of those references that have documented that during the salmon fly hatch, there are consumers that really hone in on them, and they themselves represent a really large carbon source to consumers, both aquatic and terrestrial, that eat them. Um, and so the, the, the implications for consumers may be salmon fly specific just because they are such a nice little packet of nutrition. All right, well, I think we're finishing up. Thanks. Thanks.